Hello, hello, you all. Right. OK, so hopefully we are all set up and good to go. I've got my chat running already. Uh, so we are going to get started on our live lesson. First of all, I've got a, a few few thank yous. I need to say a massive hello to uh, to Aidan and Ethan. Um, thank you so much to uh, your dad for setting all this up and to Fabian for being my uh, my nonstop tech support. This is amazing. I've already got questions coming in from Australia, from Tasmania. got VP there, uh, waiting in excitement in Stockport. Joe and Ben, amazing. A happy birthday to Fletcher, who turns eight tomorrow. I've also got a, uh, a birthday this week for Lily Taylor, who's going to be nine. And she's got a question that I absolutely love. Thank you so much for this, Lily. She asks, do any other animals pick their nose. You've given away so much in that question, Lily. Uh, essentially, you've just told the world that you pick your nose. Well, in answer, there are actually lots of animals that pick their noses, particularly primates absolutely love sticking their fingers into their schnoz. And uh, I've got a little bit of evidence of that right here. So this is a, uh, a mountain gorilla. Oh, that's rather loud. <laughs> this is a mountain gorilla. I'm not sure if you can see that but it is sticking its finger into its nostril and not only is it picking its nose, but it's eating it afterwards, which I think we can agree is the height of disgusting. So yes, there are plenty of other animals that, uh, that pick their noses, particularly things like chimpanzees and monkeys. Uh, shout out to Donald, who is, how old was he, seven today? These are zipping past. Um, Ethan asking, how fast can a crocodile run? Well, usually on land, crocs don't move that fast unless they're striking. The exception to probably things like Johnston's, a freshwater crocodile, which is pretty rapid. I mean, in short bursts, they could run pretty much as fast as we human beings can. Uh, right. Grace Harper, who's uh, 10 in Staffordshire, asks, can a dung beetle smell? Uh, well, they haven't got an, an external nose like we have, but they can pick up scent particles in the air, and they do that using their antennae. Uh, uh, dung beetles are so incredible at picking up the scent of poo that, uh, and this is kind of disgusting, but I have been in the jungle, sitting down, having my daily toilet break, when I've heard this buzzing sound coming through the treetops and out of nowhere this dung beetle just flew down from the trees and splat straight into just where I'd been going and by the, the time I turned around and seen this happening another one had come in and then another these were all bright bright green uh, they were like um, like little green jewels landing in and getting stuck into the poo and they smell it using their antenna. Uh, I've got questions coming in all over the place. Uh, George and Noah asking, when can you expect to see hedgehogs in your garden? Well, you can see them in your garden at any time of year. I mean, they uh, they stay tucked up nice and warm all the way through the winter. They are certainly emerging already now, as are all of the other animals. I mean, we are going absolutely crazy with bats here at the riverside uh, right now. I don't think I've ever seen so many bats as we're getting at night time here. And it's all because all of the, uh, the insects are starting to emerge from the water and uh, getting airborne. And that is loads and loads of food for things like bats and uh, also the, the ones down on the ground for your your hedgehogs as well. Um, I should say that I am standing here on the uh, on the prow on the front of our houseboat. So this is where Helen and I uh, lived for a couple of years. Uh, little Logan was born while we were living on this houseboat and behind me is the River Thames. Um, over the course of the next few weeks I am going to try and develop these live lessons. So uh, with the help of my friends from Nature Spy they've given me a whole bunch of um, cameras which I'm going to set up around the garden. I have some of these set up on uh, on our local badger sets. We have swans who very hopefully will, will nest in the garden here. Uh, the swallows have just come back to our patch and they normally nest underneath the dock about four or five meters away from where I am now. So I'm gonna try and set up a camera on that permanently. My hope is that I can mix backwards and forwards from all these cameras and bring you Spring Watch live from my garden. Uh, obviously, you know, we can't go f further afield than that, but uh, that is the best that I have to offer for you. Uh, what have we got? Someone there asking about, oh, 
Uh, How deep can a great white shark dive? Ted, age seven. So uh, we put an internal uh, tracker into a great white shark that measured um, the temperature inside its stomach. The idea being that when a, a great white shark opens its mouth to feed, cold water goes into its stomach. And by by finding out where that is and what what depth they're at when they do that, you can find out how deep they uh, they are feeding. Uh, and using that, we uh, we tracked a great white shark feeding at 300 meters below the surface. But it's probably they can go an awful lot deeper than that. Uh, so many questions coming in. This is absolutely amazing. Arabella Dart would like to know, do you ever get a break? Thank you so much, Arabella. I really appreciate that. And in answer to your question, I've got two tiny twins and a toddler. So no, of course I don't get a break. <laughs> uh, Joe Hooley is asking, what is the best animal you've seen from your houseboat? Um, well, I I've never seen otters from here, although they do occur on the Thames, particularly on the upper, te upper Thames. Uh, I have seen otter sprint, that's their, their poo uh, here, which is incredibly exciting. Happy birthday to Nate, who is uh, five this week. Really, really good to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much for getting in touch. Um, so Sophie and Hudson would like to know if squirrels make a noise to talk to each other. Well, they're actually uh, grey squirrels that we get here in this country, uh, which are, are non-native, but they've been here for a long time now. And they're our most dominant squirrel species, are quite vocal. There's one particular sound that, that squirrels will make in quite a few different situations, but particularly if they're, they're, they're alarmed. And it kind of goes, wee, wee, wee. So if you're in a woodland and you hear that sound, then it is probably a squirrel. And sometimes you can make that sound and they will make it back to you, which is uh, which is really amazing. Happy birthday to Alfie, who's going to be 10 on Saturday, I think. That zip passed so fast, I didn't get to all of the uh, the, the, the details there. Um, so Lucas and I from Hartlepool would like to know what got me into expeditions. Uh, so I'd probably say actually uh, scouting is where I got started. Um, I learned to kayak in the scouts at about uh, nine or ten years of age um, and I've been doing it since and lots and lots of the skills that I learned in scouting I now use on expeditions as part of my job and it's uh, you know a critical way uh, of me getting to do the things I do out in the world's wildest places and I learned those skills in the scouts. What else have we got? Ah, Dylan Pletz and Dad would like to know, have you ever discovered a new species? And if so, how did you go about it? Well, I've been on a number of, of different expeditions where we have discovered uh, new species. And, uh, you know, it, it varies tremendously. Probably the one that is most dear to me would be uh, when we were on expedition in New Guinea. And our crew discovered the world's largest species of rat, the, uh, the Basavi giant woolly rat, which looks... Something like that, if you can see that. It's actually, I tell you what, the light is making this really, really hard. But if you can see that, that is there a rat that is about the size of a dog. It is the largest rat found in the whole world, and our crew were the first ever to see it. Uh, we also, on that expedition, um, I brought back about, about six different species of frogs. It turned out to be new. The whole expedition did about 20. But something that I am particularly proud of is that at the end of last year, my great friends from the World Land Trust found this rather wonderful frog and they named it after me. This is Backshaw's frog. I'm not even making it up. It really is. How awesome is that? I am particularly chuffed about that. Someone there asking uh, how deadly is the box jellyfish. Box jellyfish uh, normally said to be the most venomous animal on the planet. No animal can stop a human heart faster. Someone asking if I swim in this river. Of course. This river is awesome to swim in. The Thames is massively on the mend. It used to be uh, really polluted, uh, really oxygen poor. But now, you know, we get so much fish here in this river in the summer and it is an absolute delight to swim in. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, Erica O'Donoghue, age 12 from Ireland, asks, Hi Steve, what's the biggest bird that has ever lived? So the uh, the largest birds that we know of that have lived are the uh, the elephant birds, which were, were found in Madagascar. They went extinct at around about the same time as human beings turned up there, uh, which I'm sure has absolutely no link. And they looked for scale alongside a human being, kind of like that. The very biggest were about 800, 860 kilos and would have stood three meters tall. Uh, so it's kind of like a, a supersized 
kind of furry ostrich. In terms of flying birds, uh, the, the biggest, I think, was Pelagornis that we know of. Uh, their wingspan would have been over six metres. Bear in mind that a wandering albatross, which is the bird that has the biggest wingspan around today, has a wingspan of just over four metres, and you can imagine how big those must have been. Again, uh, an animal that is, has uh, gone extinct. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, oh crumbs, so many questions coming through This is absolutely amazing Noah7 wants to know how fast is a peregrine falcon Usually said to be as much as 200 miles an hour in stoop Could possibly be even more Stoop is when the wings of the peregrine fold in tight And it drops down like a bullet towards its prey Hitting another bird on the wing as they're flying What's the fight fastest kind of snake we have coming in there? Sorry I missed the name on that um, It's usually said to be the black mamba But I have to say that from personal experience uh, some of the uh, the whip snakes move far, far faster than a black mamba ever uh, could. And also, intriguingly, we were releasing a king cobra, a big king cobra, in, in Bali at the end of last year. And uh, we took this king cobra out of the bag in a, a nice wild habitat where it was going to go and live. And it went off like a rocket. I mean, I, I would usually say that no snake travels faster than about 10, 12 miles an hour. This was going more like 20. Now, uh, most herpetologists, that is snake experts out there, are gonna think that I'm completely mad, but honestly, I saw it with my own eyes. We got it on camera. It was lightning. Uh, Charlene, hey, what's the, what is the longest snake? The biggest, uh, biggest snake is the anaconda, the green anaconda from uh, South America. The longest is the reticulated python from Asia. Betsy, who's five, asks, how did we get the sea? Um, that is a massive question, Betsy. I'm very, very glad that you've asked it. Uh, how can I do this in, in quick time? Okay, so uh, the world is billions of years old, and for most of its time, it hasn't looked anything like this. Um, but to begin with, to begin with, it was mostly very, very hot, molten rock. And over millions of years, water vapor emerged from that uh, molten rock and then was trapped in by our atmosphere and started to form large bodies of water. There is another really exciting hypothesis, which says that comets, which are essentially flying bodies of ice, would also have collided with the Earth and melted, and that would have helped to form the, uh, the huge bodies of water that we now call our seas and our oceans. Um, what have we got? Layla, how, what fish live in the Thames? Uh, we see perch, we see uh, a lot of mirror carp, very obvious, um, and uh, lots and lots of minnows as well. Um, Charlotte Parker, who's 11, asks, why do male seahorses have children? And is this common throughout the animal kingdom? Well, it's it's not common at all, no. So uh, the only animals that we know of that do it are things like the... Um, the pipefish, the sea dragons, the seahorses, um, and it's it's not a true pregnancy as such in the same way that we have uh, have babies. So what happens is the male, the female, transfers her egg to the male. He keeps them in a brew pouch and then uh, delivers them in spectacular fashion. Let's see if I can show you some video of that happening. Um, and uh, what he does is he sprays out the teeny tiny seahorses, which are well, they they kind of like look like miniature versions of an adult seahorse. Is that showing up on the screen? Sorry about this. This is this is really tricky. I am hoping to uh, solve all of these problems, by the way, uh, over the next coming weeks. Uh, you can barely see that, really. Take it from me. What you're seeing is lots and lots of miniature seahorses being sprayed out from the male's brew, brew, brew pouch. Um, and it's an incredible thing to see. Not many animals do it, no, uh, but the male is the one that does the uh, heavy lifting amongst seahorses. Uh, Hells, have you got anything for me up there? I've got a load of hellos for you. Oh, we've got a, a load of hellos. Okay, I'm going to zip through some. So, uh, Tian from Oz. Hi, how are you doing? Layla, Ollie, Harry, Daniel, it's his seventh birthday. Happy birthday. Ryan, his eighth birthday. Karen uh, in Dubai. Steve and Meggie. Carter from North Wales. Evelyn, Lewin and Hattie. Bailey, Carwin, who is also six today. Jensen, eighth birthday. Jameson, their birthday. And Maisie and Madison. I'm going to keep on doing as many of these shout outs as I possibly can. Ellie James, age seven, would like to, to know if I've ever met a snapping turtle. Um, Loads. In fact, one of the best uh, Deadly Sixties we ever did was uh, in Louisiana. We had um, a morning, one morning, to find uh, an alligator snapping turtle. 
and we went out checking traps with local biologists. I think we checked 10 traps and there was nothing in any of them. And then the last trap, the very, very last trap, had two giant alligator snapping turtles, the biggest they'd ever seen. Um, we could barely get them out of the water. They were extraordinary. Uh, this is known as being the, uh, the largest freshwater kind of turtle. And they have a bite which is so powerful, it's said to be able to go through a broomstick handle, which just completely blows my mind. Uh, we have um, Jolian Glover, age 10, wants to know how many times can a starfish lose its limbs? It can lose its limbs uh, for as many times as it has limbs, and it will grow them back um, over and over again as well. And this is probably due to something called pluripotent stem cells. Okay, we're going to go now to a, um, to a sound quiz. So I'm going back to uh, to native British birds. So um, sorry to all my chums over there in Australia and everywhere else around the world. But I wanted to, to hit you with a few of the sounds that you might be hearing right now in spring. Uh, so let's start off with uh, a couple of sounds which signify that spring is coming around. So one of those would be this. Choop, 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 choop. So that's one of the first sounds that you hear that lets you know that spring is around. And it's a bird that says its own name. And because of the delay, I'm going to come back to these at the end. But we'll move on to another bird, which is very much a sound of spring. So remember that one. Another bird also that says its own name. And then this one. This is... Um, a wonderful, wonderful sound. We're hearing this a lot in the fields behind my house at the moment. It is a bird that sings constantly while it's on the wing, constantly while it's in flight. And you see them flying up into the air, singing almost constantly, and then starting to drop or parachute down while making this, this wonderful sound. So we have the two note sound, which is that one. Then we have the obvious one. I'll be very disappointed if no one gets that one. And then we have this incredible tumbling, dribbling sound, which just seems to go on forever. And again, is one of the great sounds that lets you know that spring is on its way. Let's see if we're starting to get in any... Um, any answers to these? Holy moly, there are thousands and thousands of questions coming in. This is incredible. Mark Jones says, Chiff Chaff. Yes, spot on. The bird that is saying, Chiff Chaff, Chiff Chaff, Chiff Chaff is a Chiff Chaff. Yes, uh, we have lots and lots of people saying absolutely cuckoo. I mean, come on, that one's fairly obvious. But do we have the... Uh, the last bird, the bird that sings constantly. Not yet. There's an interesting one coming here. Do fish sleep? And if they do, how? Thanks from Jack, age seven. Um, in very, very different ways to how we do as human beings. Uh, but yes, absolutely. They do have periods of time where they shut off the majority of their brain. And most of the time, if you think about reef fish, what they'll do is they'll take themselves into a crack or a crevice, make themselves uh, innocuous to predators. And that might not necessarily be at night. In fact, you have different fish that are out during the daytime that are at night. And both, um, both of them are essentially just taking turns to be sleeping in their cracks, in their crevices, uh, making sure that they are free from predators. I, I haven't got anyone that's come in with the answer to my constantly singing bird. I'm sure that there is someone out there that knows what this is. It was a favourite of the romantic poets. And I tell you what, I'm going to put you all out of your misery. That is a skylark. So I've had lots and lots of people asking um, about things that we can do at home uh, while we're self-isolating uh, to try and bring wildlife to us. Um, I kind of had to be careful about this because I I'm very aware that there's lots of people that don't have gardens. And the last thing I want to do is to be spending all of this talking about what you can do in your garden if you haven't got a garden. But, you know, 87% of people or households here in the UK do have a garden. So I I'm just going to plunge on with this one thing, which is how to make a small wildlife pond. Um, and I'm going to do it with things that I would expect that you might be able to find around the house anyway. So let's start with um, an old washing up bowl. So what you would do is bury this in your back garden. 
You probably want to uh, make sure that it has in the bottom of it some gravel. Don't put soil into it, just put, put gravel in. Uh, that's going to make sure that you have better water quality. And then fill up with soil to the edge of it. You can put some native plants around the outside. It is very, very important that you make sure that any animal, any wild animal that falls into this can get out. So that's particularly important for things like hedgehogs. So make sure that there's some rocks or stones inside so that they would be able to crawl out if they fell inside. Filling it up, the absolute uh, gold standard is to use rainwater. If you've got a rainwater butt and you can fill it up uh, with that water, that is absolutely perfect. Make sure you do that though after you put this into the ground because they get quite heavy once they've got water into it. Um, it will self-populate, so animals will turn up from nowhere. All of a sudden, you'll have newts and toads and frogs turning up in even a small water feature. Right from the very first day that you set it up, uh, you will have birds coming in and using it. If you can't find a sink, you can use a, a really thick bin liner. And if you do need to uh, to seal up any holes, then just the kind of sealant that you get around the house should work pretty well, really. Um, mm. Now, I personally think that one of the, the best things that you can do is to go out pond dipping. So on my exercise, uh, I went out pond dipping and we've got here a, uh, inside there is a dragonfly larvae which is in amongst those aquatic plants. Um, but like I've said, they will fill themselves up. There are lots and lots of flying critters that will turn up, land in the pond, and within a, a matter of weeks, you will have lots and lots of wildlife coming into that water feature. Um, there are several places online where you can order and have brought to your house uh, native aquatic plants that you can put inside, which makes it even better. And then, hey presto, you have a wildlife pond, even if it's a, a small one, right there in your own back garden. Okay, now let's see what else have we got in terms of messages. My goodness, there are so so many here. Uh, Katie, was there a time with that's on uh, on Twitter? Was there a time when you were scared doing Deadly 60? Um, I, I would say not a huge amount, actually. No, I mean, my experience has taught me over and again that while we human beings can be very frightening, uh, wild animals almost never are. In fact, uh, the vast majority of wild animals would do anything they can to avoid any negative encounter with a human being because, let's face it, it's probably going to end badly for them. So most of the time, um, they tend to, to leave us well alone. In all of the time that I've been working on Deadly 60, I would say I've had a couple of times that I've been frightened with animals, um, and both times it's been with a hippo. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, what is the most evil shark from Sarah Evans? Sarah, seriously, have you never watched any of my programs? There is no such thing as an evil animal, and certainly not an evil shark. <laughs> uh, Nathan and Lewis, have you ever looked and looked for an animal and not found it before you went home? So many times, so many times. I think, uh, you know, a huge part of what I do for a living is is making do with disappointment. Uh, the mountain lion, cougar, puma, is the animal that we have had the, the most lack of success with. Uh, we have spent several months in the field uh, and never seen one. Um, and yeah, there, there is, it's just a really, really tricky animal to find. Even using camera traps, we have struggled to find uh, mountain lions or pumas. So let's move on to some more questions. Um, we have Harry Seven. What is the smallest animal alive and where can it be found? Um, the smallest insect that I'm aware of is the uh, the Dumbledore winged fairy fly, uh, which is a, a tiny, tiny parasitic uh, fly. Actually, I think it's a parasitic wasp. It's teeny tiny. It's so small that you can barely see it with the naked eye, but it has all the same features that you would expect to find on any other flying insect, even the, the very, very biggest of them. Um, Thomas asks, how many species of animals are there living today? Simple answer is, we're not sure, but it's it's many, many millions. Uh, it's believed that there are at least 800,000 species of beetle. Nothing else other than beetle, 800,000 species. There could be as many as 20 million different species on the planet today, but we are finding new ones all the time. Uh, Hugo, eight, what's, what's the heaviest animal you've picked up? Oh, crumbs, I don't know about that. Um, I suppose we've transported um, large turtles before, big um, big leatherback turtles, which have weighed about three quarters of a tonne. So yeah, they, they would probably qualify as the biggest um, that, uh, that I have picked up. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, an animal here, because I've had a question in about what my favourite kind of camouflage is, and I'm going to show you it in person. It's from this beautiful bug. So this is 
Hymenopus coronatus, the orchid mantis, and this is a youngster, a sub-adult. And I'm guessing you can probably figure out what kind of uh, vegetation in li it lives in and what it is it's mimicking. So the orchid mantis lives on particular kind of orchid blooms and it blends in with its surroundings, with its environment. So this is a sub-adult. It still has uh, another malt to go before it will have wings and be able to, to fly. Right now, it will just stay in place and wait for its prey to come to it. So if there are flies, wasps, bees, moths, butterflies that fly in to try and get a hold of the lovely nectar from the bloom that it's living on, it will snatch out at them using those raptorial forearms there at the front of its body and devour them. And it specializes in feeding on soft bodied insects. What an absolute beauty. Okay, so uh, as I said earlier on, I am gonna try and develop these sessions over the, uh, over the coming weeks. I am going to be rigging up the garden with uh, all manner of different uh, cameras so that we can have a kind of spring watch from right here in my own back garden. I'm very, very lucky to live on the river here. So we have swans, uh, we have great crested grebes, lots and lots of birds that will be nesting quite close to here. So I'm hoping that I can set up cameras so that you lot can see them in action. Uh, okay, let's move on and see if we've got some new messages. Uh, Brenda, what's your least favourite animal? I don't really have a least favourite animal. I think that uh, all animals, even things like parasites, leeches and ticks and, and fleas and mosquitoes, there's so much that's intriguing and interesting about their biology that, uh, that even those, I have to say, I, uh, I'm really intrigued by, I'm really interested in. Um, Sadie Fletcher, me and my family saw the baby seahorses being born in the Waikiki Aquarium in Hawaii. Very, very lucky. That is amazing. That's absolutely brilliant. Killian Boyle asking, am I friends with Bear Grylls? Actually, yeah, Bears is a, Bears is a good chum of mine. We, uh, we both work together for the Scouts. We're both amb ambassadors for scouting. And um, I think the work that he's doing with scouting is absolutely amazing. Um, I have a few questions coming in about how um, animals that are uh, invertebrates or reptiles manage to grow by shedding their skin. And I can show you that with this rather amazing little find. So this is not a tarantula. It is a tarantula's exoskeleton. It's shed skin. So invertebrates have a hard exoskeleton. Their skeleton is on the outside of their body and they grow by cracking out. You can see the abdomen there is cracked down the middle and emerging soft bodied from inside and every time they do that, they will grow a little bit and they leave behind what looks like a full spider. If you see one of these hanging up around your house and you think that it's a, a dead house spider, it's probably not. It's probably just the molt. And actually, this is so well preserved that I can even possibly show you the fangs. Can I get that close enough to the camera that you can see those fangs? Yeah, no, not so much. OK, so. We are coming up to the half hour. That is it for my live lesson. Uh, but I just wanted to try one little thing. As I've said, oh, I've got a few uh, few hellos Hello. coming in. Okay, so we have a hello to uh, Lila and Rex from Singapore. Really, really good to hear from you guys. Harry and Phoebe, Blythe from Milton Keynes. Amanda, happy birthday to you. Scarlett and Laurelie Lor from Scotland. Evie, Helen and her llamas. Hello to Helen and your llamas. Uh, Josh from Bendigo in Oz. Josh, I'm really hoping we're going to be out doing our live tour back in Bendigo uh, again in January. Uh, Joseph, who is six today. Jack and Tom. Uh, my, my nephews, Jack and Tom. I haven't said hello to them yet. Hello, you both. Hello, Captain Jack and Tom along to Tyler in Penzance. Um, and Bailey says, say hi to Freddie and Daddy at home. Uh, Bailey is in hospital right now. Bailey, I'm really, really sad to hear that. Um, so there's one last thing, thing I need your help with to try. As I said, I'm trying out lots and lots of tech to try and make these live lessons better. One of those is these, these special cameras that I have rigged up. Um, and I'm also trying to, to get my own broadcasting studio working here, but I'm doing this on my own. So uh, it's quite complicated. So I need your help. I'm going to try this out and I need you all to tell me on the messaging if it works. So I'm going to mix now to some images from my Badger cam and I'm going to carry on talking. And I need you to tell me if you're seeing it and if you're hearing it. 
So you might have heard there the little sounds from my two badgers. This is in my set, my local set around the corner, um, scurrying back into the set when it started raining. Uh, and there was this incredible little contact call, not what you'd really expect from a badger. Um, and it's also quite interesting that they were out feeding and a little bit of rain came down and they scampered straight back home into the set. I mean, seriously, you would have thought badgers would be tougher than that. Um, so that's the software that I'm going to be using. Hopefully that has worked. So I'm going to check it all out and make sure it works. And if it does, then we shouldn't have to be worrying with uh, any more of this nonsense over coming weeks. So tell all your friends, live lessons with Steve Backshaw, 9.30 on Wednesdays. Get your questions in and I'll do my very best to answer as many of them as I can from all around the world. But again, I had to finish with a massive, massive shout out to my sister Jo, who is a, uh, a nurse working with the NHS, who is very much on the front line, to my uh, my brother-in-law Ben and my sister-in-law Freya, both of whom are again working in, in ICU um, and doing so, so much to, to make sure that we just all keep functioning, putting themselves at risk so that, uh, that we can all be safe. To everyone working uh, in the NHS and other vital jobs thank you for everything you're doing that's all uh, for this week from me i will see you next week